In this lesson, we're going to look at how to extract metals. The first aim is describe what an ore is, and then explain what happens during an oxidation and reduction reaction, and explain how our method of extracting metals depends on their reactivity. Now, metals are important for all living organisms. You will find metals in plants and animals, such as the iron in our blood, which helps us transport oxygen to our cells. In fact, try and imagine a world without metals. You'd have to say goodbye to half your kitchenware and also all electronic devices. Yes, we love metals, but the problem is we're running out of some metals. This has led scientists to find metals in very unusual ways. For example, due to the low availability of copper, scientists have started to use a process known as phytomining. This is when we grow plants in copper-containing soils. They take the copper into, for example, their leaves. Then when they die, we burn the plants and extract the copper from the ashes. Pretty amazing, really. Some metals are really easy to extract because they are so unreactive, they are found naturally uncombined to any other element. For example, gold and silver are so unreactive that we just need to dislodge them from the mine, as simple as plucking an apple off a tree. But most metals are reactive, and they readily react with oxygen to form metal oxides. A metal that is found naturally reacted to another element is called an ore. So the textbook definition of an ore is a compound that contains a metal, or enough of a metal that makes it worth extracting. Ores are in limited supply. So, for example, iron ore is iron oxide, where iron reacts with oxygen. Aluminium ore is aluminium oxide, where aluminium reacts with oxygen. We call aluminium ore bauxite. You will need to know that. So, within this ore, which essentially looks like a rock, you will find aluminium, which is basically being held captive by oxygen. If we can find a way to separate the aluminium from the oxygen, then we can extract the aluminium. So that is how you describe what an ore is. So now is a good time to bring in the idea of oxidation and reduction reactions. As I said, most ores are when a metal is combined to an oxygen to form a metal oxide. So when ores form, metals bind to oxygen. So oxidation is gaining an oxygen. This is how ores form. Reduction is when a substance such as a metal loses an oxygen. So reduction is losing an oxygen, and this is how metals are extracted from their ore. So this is an example of where we can show oxidation and reduction in a way that extracts copper from copper oxide. Here, copper oxide is going to react with the more reactive element, carbon, to produce copper and carbon dioxide. Here's the balanced symbol equation. So we have two molecules of copper oxide. Remember the large number here means how many molecules. We're reacting it with carbon to produce two atoms of copper and a molecule of carbon dioxide. So just so you understand visually what's going on here, here's our two molecules of copper oxide. Two molecules here, you can see they're separated because they're individual molecules. So two CuO reacting with a single carbon atom. So now we're going to reduce copper oxide. That means take away the oxygen from copper oxide. This involves heating the copper oxide with carbon, so get them nice and hot. And because carbon is more reactive than copper, it will basically steal the oxygen from the copper to form carbon dioxide. Copper oxide is being reduced, but carbon is being oxidized because it's gaining an oxygen, so we're oxidizing carbon. So whenever you're presented with a chemical equation which shows reduction by carbon, remember two things are going on here. It's not just reduction. The copper oxide or the ore is being reduced, but the carbon is always being oxidized to form carbon dioxide. They like to test you on this by seeing if you're aware that this equation involves both, not just reduction. Also, students commonly make the mistake by just saying copper is being reduced. It's not. The entire ore is. Copper oxide is the thing that's losing oxygen. And carbon is being oxidized, so carbon is the thing that's gaining oxygen to form carbon dioxide. 
also be aware we have two copper atoms. That's what this means, okay? They're not joined together. They're not a molecule. If there's a little two there, then they'd be stuck together. It'd be a molecule. But metals don't do that. So you'll find them as single atoms in chemical symbol equations. Whereas this is a molecule of carbon dioxide because the atoms actually bonded together, stuck together. So just remember, in these examples, metals become oxides through oxidation. So that's when they gain an oxygen and we extract metals through the process of reduction where they lose an oxygen. And that's how you explain what happens during oxidation and reduction reactions. So now let's look at the reactivity series and understand why it's important in terms of extracting metals. So the reactivity series is basically just a list of metals and carbon, a non-metal, in order of their reactivity, with potassium at the top being the most reactive, going down to the least reactive gold and silver at the bottom. Depending on how reactive the metal is, we use different extraction techniques. So gold and silver are the easiest to extract because they occur in nature uncombined because they are so unreactive. So you don't get gold oxides and silver oxides. Anything which is lower in reactivity than carbon can be reduced by carbon. So just like in the reduction and oxidation reactions I just showed you, you'd employ exactly the same idea to separate these metals from their ores or oxygen. So carbon will steal the oxygen away from these metal oxides. It will steal oxygen from zinc oxide. It will steal oxygen from iron oxide. So this is how the process works. You take your ore, so for example, let's say this is copper ore. It contains copper, which is reacted with oxygen, and we put it into our blast furnace. And then we take carbon, very cheap, very easy to find. For example, ash and soot are full of carbon, and we put that into our blast furnace. And then we'll heat the blast furnace intensely so that they react. So we keep on heating it until the carbon reacts with the oxygen which is bonded to the copper to form carbon dioxide. And of course that leaves us with beautiful shiny copper. So all these metals in the reactivity series can be extracted in exactly the same way. I've put a star by iron because that's the most popular metal they test you on in an exam paper. That's simply because iron is so incredibly useful to us. But what happens when metals are more reactive than carbon? We can't use carbon to steal the oxygen away. We need another method. So once again, I've listed all these reactive metals here, but the only one you really need to pay attention to is aluminium, again, because it's so useful to us. So it frequently comes up in exam papers. Now, reduction by electrolysis, in other words, taking away an oxygen from a compound by electrolysis, is far more expensive because we need a lot of energy in the form of electricity to do this. Remember, carbon is dirt cheap, literally dirt cheap. So if we need energy, we're burning fossil fuels to get that energy, and there's obviously impacts there, for example, the environment and climate change. So electrolysis is not ideal, but necessary at the moment. In fact, even when we extract some metals by reduction, they're still a little bit impure, a little bit dirty with other elements, so we can use electrolysis to purify them. So here's an example of how electrolysis would work. You connect two carbon electrodes, for example, they can be metals instead, to two different terminals of the power pack. You then get your electrolyte, your metal compound solution, or molten, melted metal compound, and then you administer an electric charge, the charge will break apart the compound and you'll see oxygen gas forming here, for example, although in this it's actually chlorine gas. And on the other electrode, on the cathode, you will see the metal forming. So when we turn around and see the metal, you can see shiny copper coating the electrode. So at the anode you're getting oxygen and here you'll be getting copper. In this specific example, I was actually electrolyzing copper chloride. That's why you've got chlorine gas here, not oxygen, and you've got copper here. But to give you a more real-world example, here we have aluminium ore, or bauxite, and what we're going to do is we're going to heat it strongly until it melts. And now we have molten, that means melted, aluminium oxide, and now we're ready to apply electrolysis. So here we have the electrolysis set up. We've got the anode, which is the electrode attached to the positive terminal of our electricity supply, and the cathode, which is attached to the negative terminal of our electricity supply. 
So the electricity will basically separate aluminium from oxygen and it will end up with aluminium basically deposited at the base of the reacting chamber. Whilst oxygen will be attracted to the anode and will form a gas and we'll see it leaving. So this comes up quite a lot in exams and can even be the basis of a six mark question. For example, it might ask you why do you use different techniques to separate iron from its ore and aluminium from its ore? So just remember, iron is less reactive than carbon, so it can be reduced by carbon. In that reaction, the iron oxide is heated with carbon, and that will produce pure iron and carbon dioxide. Aluminium, however, is more reactive than carbon, so you cannot reduce it with carbon. Instead, you have to use electrolysis. When an electric current, or more specifically a direct current, will break apart aluminium from its oxide. But also remember, electrolysis requires more energy and therefore is very expensive. So now you can explain how our method of extracting metals depends on their reactivity.